Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering IBM Edge 2015, brought to you by IBM. Welcome back to Las Vegas, everybody. This is Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. We're here live at IBM Edge 2015. This is our fourth edge. Phil Schamberger is here, he's the Director of Technical Delivery of Proactive Systems, uh, Proactive Solutions. Phil, welcome back to theCUBE, it's good to see you again. Thank you. So Edge, another Edge. That's uh, right. We spend a lot of time in Las Vegas. <laughs> we storage <laughs> folks, don't we? That's right. <laughs> but, uh, but it's a good show, good action. It's not just storage this year. It's uh, more diverse, a lot of power, a lot of Z, a little middleware action, some thought leadership. What's your take overall? Well, we, uh, I I'm happy to be here. We have, uh, we have we sell a lot of the IBM portfolio. We have a power heritage. Um, it's nice to be able to get uh, both technologies in in the same conference. Um, we brought a lot of our folks down here. It has been split before, so it's kind of like, a, it's fun to mingle with others because I, I cross over to both brands when I, you know, from a technical perspective in sales. So when did you start picking up power and working with? with um, it was uh, 18 years ago yeah, we, so we were doing uh, power, so it, it's been a large part of our business over the last uh, Big commitment. several years. Were you we worried there for a while? Like, hmm, where's this all going? No, no I, I think it's uh, more, I worry more today than I have ever in the past because you know, it's, it, there's a- uh, Uncertainty. Yeah, there's uncertainty yeah. for power and I think that the, uh, our, our investment hasn't decreased, but the you know a lot of our clients are are looking at greenfield landscapes, x86, cloud, and without having a real solid cloud provider for power, it kind of slowed the uh, growth in that. Well, space. now you got power for soft layer. That's and, right, and, and open power. That's got to really excite you. Yeah, it's. I mean, the the Linux workloads. Uh, I feel like, the you know, getting them on power, you have to you have to love it to run it on there, unfortunately, so a lot of it is going on x86. So we hear a lot about you know, transformations and, and proactive, you, you do a lot of storage, yep. sell a lot of IBM storage, other company storage as well, but really strong partnership with IBM. Uh -huh. What's happening in the storage world? A lot of shifts, flash is coming in, you know, tape's not dead, what, give us your take on Well, we storage. have, uh, Flat flash for everything. That's kind of been the, the message that we brought to our clients. And you take all the pressure off your typical storage infrastructure from a disk perspective if you move into the flash space and it takes a lot of guesswork out of a lot of what our clients have been doing. You know, provisioning was an issue for clients because they had to figure out RAID types, spindle types, all these different things that flash now just makes it a lot easier. You have a pool of fast storage it'll handle any workload on the planet, and it just makes life a lot easier for our customers. So you need less of it to service the application. Absolutely. It's going to draw less power, it's going to be less, less space. How about this idea of serving copies out of Flash? Are you seeing clients do that? In other words, everybody's copy creep. Yeah. You got a copy for your data warehouse, you got a copy for your test, a copy for your dev, a copy for your backup, a copy for the replication, and the, you know, your test guys and your dev guys, are you using data that's out of date? Are you seeing clients service those different use cases with the, the, the same or, you know, physical you know, array, if you will? Yeah, um, you know, this, this may be a little plug for Actifio. You know, they brought copy data management onto the scene and, yeah. uh, and really I felt like they coined that phrase. But you know, with, with, if, if you look at their value proposition, that really works well with Flash because you're talking about having a primary copy and serving it out to all those locations, but the cloning Cloning technology of data, providing a read-write clone, you know, NetApp used to be the best at that, but then you, you look at these other technologies, even in like the IBM V9000, um, you have that software stack where you can provide a read-write copy to any one of the applications, but essentially it's still using the same primary storage. And Flash is the best for that because the, your service level is so high, you can run a lot of workloads in the same footprint. So, you know, storage, you know, it's storage, right? It used to spin, now it smokes fast, it's great. <laughs> How do you differentiate you know, from the competition? What, what do you bring to clients that's of value, that they perceive as value? Well, you know, as a, we kind of, we're, we're a trusted advisor in the space. We know a lot of lines of storage, we've seen it, have a lot of experience. You know, our, our company's 18 years old already, um, and we've been through uh, all the different storage types. You know, started, I started 
SAN technology in 2000, uh, working with uh, fiber channel SANs and disk subsystems and, and shared storage. Um, and I, I, you know, we, we provide a depth of knowledge and we've made investments in, I guess you would say, human capital. Make the right hires, hire the right people to grow your business. And it's really, I mean, year to year, our growth has been phenomenal. And it's, I think it's because we made the investments ahead of time, not only in the people, but in our facilities. We have uh, data centers uh, with uh, test and dev equipment that our clients can use. And then we also can bring that on premise for them to do uh, proof of concept for both flash and sand volume controller, virtualization. Um, so we, we have that equipment. I think that's that's provided us an edge as a business partner for making those the right investments to you know help our clients out and be uh, very quick to deliver. If they say, I want to test this and I, want, I have the other vendor's equipment sitting here, uh, we're able to bring it on site and give, a, you know, give the other vendors a run for their money. So you say you're growing, you're growing fast. Uh -huh. um, which the market's not growing fast, so obviously you're gaining share. Yeah. And, and, and talk more about what you attribute that to. I mean, you, you see the financials of all the large you know, storage players, you know, IBM included, IBM saying, hey, we, you know, we grew 2% in, in constant currency. You know, 2%'s not like meteoric growth, but your experience, very high growth, why? Well, the, the, the data growth has been extremely large. Um, I have to say Internet of Things because I have a coworker that we've, we've been trying to define that and we laugh at it all the time. We're like, well, it's the Internet of Things. It's bringing all this data in. But that, that growth has not stopped. So we turn around and, uh, but Flash is the shiny new penny. Everybody wants to look at it. And it's exciting for us in the storage space because we've just kind of had the same old, same old. Um, you know, XIV is a good space for us still. And I would say that is the easiest storage on the planet to manage, and that's why folks continue to use it, and the capacity is very, very high on a single you know, single floor tile. And so those, those areas of growth, it's the, the fl flash is hot, and everybody wants to talk about it, so that makes life interesting, and I think our, our growth has really came from all those conversations. Even though the sales cycle might not turn into a flash opportunity, it's given us a chance to interact with customers and see where they're going. So, so Phil, well, one of the things I found interesting at the show is, you know, storage we spend time, tend to spend way too much time talking about speeds and feeds. Uh, and flash is great, it's much higher performance, you know, the power and cooling are phenomenal, you know, CapEx, OpEx, but it's the real, you know, opportunity to, you know, transform the business. If you look at what fat flash can do, and I can, you know, really improve test dev, I can create new business lines. Uh, at this show, you know, we've been hearing IBM talk about how you know, analytics and you know, leveraging Flash can kind of transform the business. How, how's that impacting how you interact with the customers? Your trusted advisor, is it more, you know, I, I know it's got to be much more than just, hey, which is the best box to buy? Yeah. So how are you, you know, changing that consultative approach? Yeah, that, and speeds and feeds, I'm, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of, I'm past that now. I mean, you, you have to you have to learn when you're in a sales situation that speeds and feeds don't matter anymore, and there are tons of flash products on the market that will do the job. And I think IBM Engineering gives them a little bit of a leg up, so that that's nice. But then um, having a such a breadth of software products that IBM has and systems, like you said, big data. That is a that's an area where you know analytics as a service and those types of conversations we start to talk to the line of business about what their needs are because the infrastructure now is pretty sound and, and very fast, very highly available. Um, but our, our conversations, we dabble in cloud too all the time. Every conversation goes there. Why, why would we buy this system when we can put it in the cloud? And the typically goes on to what's your bandwidth requirements, how are you going to get the data back to your users, and uh, that's why the hybrid, you know, hybrid storage, hybrid compute is going to be a, kind of a, the future of this technical world. Yeah, and I'm wondering if you talk about kind of the, the storage buyer and the storage user. Uh, you know, that world's changed a lot. You know, I, I've been talking for years about how, you know, we need to get out of our silos, but unfortunately we tend to build new silos. That's Virtualization right. kind of is a new silo. Even converged, if it isn't the platform for everything, it, it can be another s silo. So, you know, what, what's the dynamic you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, the, the engineers on the, we, we're trying to always fix operational inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. Hyper-converged or converged should do that. But you have to be a, you have to be an awesome technician to understand all those technologies. You typically have a networking guy and a compute guy and a storage guy, and to bring that all into one human being is very difficult. So those are those guys are few and far between. But so the data center isn't getting 
a whole lot more simple. But I do like the hyperconverged model because it takes a few aspects out of that. Um, you know, and unfortunately, it's not a big storage play, which is a, a big growth area of ours. But you know, we're not standing still. We're innovating. We're we're you know pulling in the right resources to grow our converged and hyperconverged yeah, environments uh, too. So, so actually, I I, I kind of like it's not a storage play because convergence. We found that storage is the stickiest component of convergence, and therefore it tends to be the driver for it. Hyperconvergence is really about changing those operational models, and therefore it's it's you know really it's an infrastructure play, uh, not you know so much a storage. Play. Place. So yeah, I met uh, with a client yesterday yeah. about this same topic. Uh, that I was talking, he, he was saying, well, what what about this software-defined data center? What am I supposed to do? What am I trying to understand? I said, well, what are you? First of all, you have to define where your issues are and and what you're trying to fix. And you know, I said, well, are there operational inefficiencies? He's like, well, we were going to do this Oracle project with some with some Flash and took us six months to get an uh, Oracle rack cluster built, and then it came back and they blamed it on the storage team. But the, you know, the, it, it's just acquisition of hardware and configuration, and then you know, at the very last minute, you're like, wait, we have to have storage. And so the storage guys get put under pressure to bring that up to the front, and something that might take uh, 10 minutes has been, you know, might sit out there for two months. So, so how, how's IBM doing as a partner for the converged space? Uh, you know, and you, you look at—they've got you know all the Pure Family, you know, Pure App, and the Pure Flex working with Lenovo. And now there's the Pure Power that they announced this week, um, and you know they don't have a hyper-converged solution today. So, what, what's the conversation you're having with IBM? How do they help you do your job? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, that, that's a bit of—I feel uncomfortable. You can yeah. see it in my body language. We're, we're not at an IBM yeah, show. Just tell us right, what you're thinking. Right. So. <laughs> The, uh, I think that there's a there's something missing there. Yeah. We do have a we do have a power heritage, so we understand the technologies of a power converged solution. Uh, do we under the other thing is do we have a use case for it? And with the again, x86 Greenfield is the another shiny penny in the technology world, and it meshes so well with your you know S3 and Azure and all the different cloud providers, even SoftLayer. If you're you know it, you have to love power to move into a power converged environment. So I feel like IBM does have a missing link there, uh, not having an x86. And I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of the divestiture to Lenovo. I really feel like that that took a lot of wind out of our sails because we had great success with the PureFlex system. Uh, there might not be a lot of partners that did, but we sure did. And so I, you know, I miss having that uh, capability. But but we're still a great partner with Lenovo, and we're 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 pushing forward uh, in that space. Well, I mean, uh, let's face it, a, a lot of partners freaked out about that. I mean, there's no good timing. At least they did it in the first quarter, so it wasn't, you know, the biggest quarter. Um, and yeah, the reasons are clear. I mean, wants to chase profit, not not revenue. And, yep. And you know, you got to respect that. Um, but of course, there's opportunities there that now go away. Absolutely. So from your standpoint, so be it. Uh, what about some of the challenges that you're seeing with customers, maybe some of the mistakes that you see customers making? Uh, what are some common sort of missteps that you can help advise customers through? Well, it is, a little bit of it is, if they don't attend events like this, and you know, this is a plug for the big event world, but if you, if you don't attend events like this, you're standing still. I mean, it, you, you have to educate yourself, and customers a lot of times are just status quo is the way to go, because if I change something, I'm going to break it, and I don't want to. I don't want to deal with the business coming down on me because I stepped up to a new technology or a new methodology that didn't, that wasn't su successful. So, customers aren't. If if they don't innovate, they're going to be behind, um, and we we are we're helping our customers be aggressive, and uh, and we we have consulting services and, and a network of experts that we can you know bring into our customer sites and provide them that sense of security that this is going to go okay and we give them the confidence to step into new technologies and new methods in their in their data centers. So a lot of customers would say, yeah, that sounds good, but it sounds like I got to buy a bunch of services, expensive services to get there. How do you overcome that challenge? Well, I mean there's there's value in it all and we're we're very efficient as a as a partner with our customers. We we join their team, we try to help them do their job better. We don't replace them. So that that's just our method, uh, our delivery method. It's a lot different than some. We're we're not there to camp out and just, you know, 
milk it for all it can be. We're, we're going in there to educate them on how they can become better. And but and now all, almost all of our all of our uh, conversations are driven to what's the line of business need? Who is your customer? And your customer are the users sitting across the room from you. And you want to provide you know. They want you want them to be delighted with their experience when they log into their application and they're trying to get work done. That you don't want them to wait around or or be uh, you know ha have issues right there at work when they're trying to be productive. Phil, you make it sound so simple. <laughs> yeah, Phil, you actually bring up a, a great point. I wonder if I can unpack a little bit with you. Is you know jobs. Uh, you know, so many people are a little bit fearful. Things like converge or even hyperconverge is, oh my gosh, that's gonna, you know, get rid of the jobs. I've yet to talk to a customer that deploys these that said, you know, hey, you know, you know, we had so much free time and we did so many things that we just decided to, you know, lay off 20% of our staff. It was the, oh my. You know, that big security project that's been sitting on my desk for two years, yeah. that new business app that the business team's been asking for me, or the thing that they were like swiping a credit card and the Amazon bill was getting too much for, we can now handle that and either manage it, do the cloud stuff more, pull it in together. You know, do, you know, do you have any customers that are really you know, jumping on this and you know, really driving that next opportunity? Well, we try to show in our, in our business case to a client, we'll show that there's operational efficiency. Sometimes it can reduce head count and you try to put that in as your cost justification, but realistically, there are people that are sitting there and they're swamped, and they do get a chance then to maybe actually kick back, go to an event, innovate, learn something new, and bring that into the business to where before, they're just trying to keep, you know, put fires out. And so hyper-converged or converged solutions might come in and provide, you know, the bandwidth that they need to kind of get back to to real life versus just uh, working nights and weekends to put out uh, fires. Yeah, well, D Dave, you always talk about you know the CIO's challenges is you know they got to run the business of course, but how do they grow the business and how do they transform the business? And we want IT to be able to really move up the stack to, to be able to take care of. Well, them. it's one of my pet peeves when you talk about IT economics is everybody focuses, of course, rightly so, on TCO, but it's it's very rare that people say, okay, hey, we put in this new infrastructure, we're going to fire people. Yeah, I mean maybe it does happen sometimes, but really. Organizations, and I love your uh, thoughts on this, Phil, really need to think through, okay, I'm going to be able to do more with less, but I'm going to free up time. What do I want people to do with that time? You mentioned you know, some ideas come out, think about, it. we all know, when we go to these events, you know, when we're not doing 60 interviews a day, <laughs> and we sit back and you listen to some of these thought leaders, you get ideas and you bring those ideas back to your organization. So my question is, how are people handling that ostensibly cost savings, but it's really not cost savings, it's cost avoidance, yeah. it's freeing up new time. You mentioned Stretching your dollar and, a little bit Yeah, further. is there a gain share mentality in IT? I feel like there's not enough of a gain share. Hey, we're going to save money going forward, so let it give us a, a piece of the savings so that we can go innovate. I feel like a lot of corner office execs are like, great, drop it to the bottom line, more profit, more profit, yeah, more how profit. Yeah, how do you get compensated? If you're a CIO and you cut costs, that might be how you get compensated. Right. So part of that is you're going you're gonna to always sell what you get paid for, right? <laughs> oh. And that, that and, and a CIO is going to sell that to the executives well, within an organization that, hey, I cut costs, this is how I did it. And sometimes people lose their jobs, but not often. I mean, they're, they're they're, they're trying to find oh. new ways to get things done within the same organization. And if you're good at your job, you're always going to have a job. That's kind of the way I look at it. But, sure. but you can't stand still. And, and you know, this, uh, I, I attended another conference. This is my third one in Vegas this year. Jeez. Uh, but anyway, there's another IBM uh, Interconnect earlier this year. And we were there. I, I, I sat <laughs> in and I watched uh, uh, oh, one of the presenters talking about mobile. And how exciting is that space? I mean, they're they had some of the coolest things going on and how companies are coming together to provide, and, and this is a, a funny one too, like Bluemix or DevOps and those kinds of things to bring into this mobile space, but I, I'm finding that most of the C-level executives that I get a chance to sit across from are talking about that space, mobile and security, and not so much compute, even though that's where all my knowledge is and that's where I spend a lot of time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to transform my conversations into understanding, again, business needs and how they can drive revenue and not have to cut headcount. Because if you're growing, you're, that, that's really never going to be a situation where a CIO is going to try to save money by reducing headcount. Right. There's ways to, you know, gain market share, gain customer base, and mobile is by far the easiest way to do that if you can figure out how to leverage it. Well, it's like John Furrier says, 
I've never heard somebody say I want less compute, but it's not the, it's compute enables that innovation, right? It's not innovation in and of itself. Phil, we got in the hook, we got to go, but thanks very much, really appreciate the conversation. Absolutely, great to be here. Now keep right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest. We're live from Edge 2015. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back.